It's an age-old question, literally from the dawn of modern man. Why do we need money to function? Why have such catastrophic periods happened when there was a shortage of cash, not enough greenbacks to go around? Thankfully, we have a financial historian at hand to answer these existential queries, and as we hope is frequently the case with our podcast, we wish to put both the concept and utility of money into historical perspective to help handle today's sometimes questionable media explanations of economic change and its consequences. It also reinforces the axiom that when you wish to know the inspiration for someone's or even an entire society's behavior, just follow the money. That's where we start at the Rotterdam this week with the origins and uses of cash. You know, it's a source of much fighting, you know, on Wall Street, in Washington, on macro Twitter. People argue about the definitions of money as much as the uses. There's inflation, deflation, Fed, bank bailouts. But what we do know is that money is extremely important. I mean, the first evidence we have of money, of credit money, is at the same time we have evidence of writing. They're from the same period. And there's even some that believe that that the, the need for money drove the need for writing rather than rather than any other way. I think it's a very powerful statement to make. It might not be true, but it's it's definitely possible. Carrying around something large, heavy, and valuable in medieval times would be inherently dangerous. Money solved a lot of very simple problems, especially for uh, farmers, interrelations between nations that at any given time were at war, etc. Absolutely. So, so what we do know for sure, and there's a lot of debate about what money is and how it should be used and what it, you know, how it was used, in fact, to some degree. What we do know is the lack of it causes major problems. You know, people get desperate. Desperate enough to risk being boiled in oil in the Middle Ages or their hands cut off in, uh, in the Germanic states, post-Charlemagne. People will go through, will do anything to get enough money to make the economy work. Now, by, lack, because, of, by lack of money, you're, are, you, are you discussing concentration of wealth or literally the amount of money in circulation? All of the above. But basically, you know, too little money is if whatever, whatever we mean by too little money has caused, you know, throughout history caused grief for entire populations and groups of people. But mostly the poor, and especially the urban poor, suffered the most. The elites generally ignored the common person. So they said they cared about money at all. They didn't really care about it in the terms of what the poor and the working the working individuals are using. I, even this even happened in the in the 21st century. In India, they bought in 2016, they botched the 1000 rupee note exchange. Basically, all the poor people couldn't take their notes back, and so they lo- they basically lost money, and the poor suffered. So this is not like a new phenomenon. So, throughout history, we've had cases where the state just ignores, doesn't understand the populace need money. And certain capitalist systems seems to not understand, or in the other extreme, communist systems seem to not understand that a concentration of wealth prohibits the existence of any kind of middle class. So absolutely right. So so when you talk about gold and silver as in bullion and coins as currency. Keep in mind that the average wage in industrial, in industrial Britain, in the Industrial Revolution, was like one-eighth of the smallest possible civil, silver coin a day. So clearly gold and silver were terrible to grease you know, the, you know, the wheels of commerce for the common person. When you think about gold and silver, you think about, really just think about stores of wealth, think about the state, think about like Fort Knox. We don't really think about the average person. And so the lack of money shows itself easiest during the harvest. So we see funny money, if you like, non-state money, private money invented by the people coming into the fore in places like Japan during the harvest. You see Chinese coins, counterfeit coins being used because the shortage of money threatened the livelihood of the farmers because they brought the produce to market. There was only a certain amount of money. So there was basically a seasonal shortage of money That would cause deflation during harvest time, which was really bad for the farmers. Are you talking about you talking about currency entrepreneurs? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And but not just currency entrepreneurs. I mean, we do know that the Fed, the Fed, the U.S. Federal Reserve, one of one of its main justifications for its existence was because the exact same phenomenon happened in the in in the U.S. a bit later on. But yeah, we have private actors will come in. Like I said, they could be counterfeiters, or they happen to be at risk of getting killed to fill a market demand. This demand in this case is the rice farmers Japan um, not having enough cash and having deflation and suffering, basically losing money. 
When you say every risk of, harvest period, when you say risk of being killed, you mean facing the penalty for counterfeiting or contravening the state's currency. Yeah, currency monopoly, right? States, national currencies are a source of national power. The seniorage of it is a source of, of revenue to the state. So yeah, they, people generally states don't like when private individuals print their own money, but they often did. They often let it happen. The biggest problem was because these gold and silver coins weren't very useful for the average person. For much of recorded history, we know that we didn't use money, we used credit. In Rome, the Trajan market stallholders would keep a list of what people owed because the, the basic currency for the, for the average person was six foot long iron bars. In the Middle Ages, Britain, it was the church. 7,000 years ago, it was the temple priest in Mesopotamia. So these are these, basically these credit ledgers were basically keeping track of who, who owed what to whom. And that was true also through long periods of, of Chinese history, we had private money that dominated. We talk about deflation during harvest time. You might say, well, def I, and you know, I always say deflation is really, really bad, right? We know it was one of the major causes of the Great Depression. It could even be worse in some, in some regards. The lack of silver minting after the Civil War in the U.S. result in deflation, yes, but actually the economies are growing. What it did do was it re-enslaved the newly free into becoming sharecroppers. Because there was no money, to, the, the farmers who now were on the land had no money to buy supplies because there wasn't any money. It was a small change. So basically, company stores would lend them all the things they needed to farm in return for a percentage of, of, the, uh, of the harvest. So basically, we just, you just took newly freed slaves and re-enslaved re them because there wasn't enough money. So these are really, really bad things. You know, most of us have heard about, you know, cigarettes in prison camps or chewing gum or whatever it happens to be. And all these stories, one thing is clear, right? We don't have enough money, we have desperation. But what's really cool is human ingenuity, entrepreneurship, as you said earlier, it can often be the result. Now, it might not be the optimal solution, but it just goes to show you how important money is. As I said, you know, in China in the 1600s, well, actually for all of recorded history in China, post-Roman Empire, there, there, was, there were no coins. England was no different. After the Romans left, there, there was really no small change, which was okay for a pastoral barter-ish economy with, with trusted counterparties, like the church could keep the records, that was fine. But they're not good for arm's length transactions. I pay for a factory worker or for a beer, at, you know, like you said, on, on your travels on your way from one town to another. The shortage would have been catastrophic from this revolution, right? Because how do you pay people if you have many coins? The smallest silver coin, where they were getting lost anyway, or wrecked, they were, they were too big to pay anybody anything. So there was nothing to, to be able to pay somebody who could then buy bread and then buy beer or whatever else they needed, uh, buy, cow, buy a cow. And this was true for, as true in 1380 in England as it was true in 1729. And, you know, people complained, but the, the elites didn't listen. They didn't care. It really wasn't really important until the Industrial Revolution, ha Industrial Revolution happened. What did happen was aggressive counterfeiting. So by the third quarter of the 18th century, so like 1770 or something, the mint, the, the British mint had long since ceased minting anything. Silver, because it was basically legally undervalued, and they gave up producing any other coins as well. So basically, the merchants, industrialists, wage earners were all left to fend for themselves in just pre-industrial pre revolution Britain. So what happened? So it started with local tokens. So a brewer would say, for example, would they might, they might take a small silver coin in and give somebody eight tokens, 20 tokens, 20 non-state tokens, non-state issued tokens. They were hand minted. You basically stamped them with a big hammer. And then they would be good. We, each one would be good for a beer. Right? This, so sounds like now the dawn, can, this sounds like the dawn of casino chips. It's very similar. Exactly. So you've, bought, you've, you've bound that person to your brewery, right? That's one thing you've done. And, but these things can't travel very far. They're only, like you said, they're only good at the casino. They're only good at that one brewery. And they're very easy to counterfeit. They're hand minted. It's just you take, take a piece of whatever, tin, and smack it with a hammer with something, and you can, you've can you counterfeited the, the token that was available, the brewer's token. Which, in the case and, of a brewery, could be a major problem, yes. It, well, it just, it just meant that everybody, like I said, the sharecroppers who were, who were basically bound to the company store in the, in the post bell in the U.S., same here, right? Now you've got eight brewer tokens for one brewery. There's no free market there, I guess is the way to look at it. What started to happen was these companies started to be, as industrialization happened, these companies started to have to pay people. And they really couldn't, because they make promises. Sometimes they would just let people steal the tools, whatever it happened to be. They, there were different ways of paying people, none of which were very efficient, right? Um, they would take home, like, I don't know, they'd take home like a half a carcass of a cow or something as pay. It's not really a very efficient way to do it. But one company, the Paris Mining Company of Anglesey, it was a mine. So it had lots of copper. 
So it said, here, I know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna hand mint a bunch of copper tokens. And I use those to pay people. I'm gonna call them, we're gonna call them pennies. So they basically, we're gonna say that if you bring them back to us, we'll give you real state back currency. But again, the problem is they're, they're, hand, they're hand struck and they're easy to counterfeit. An incredible thing happened. What started this, the industrial revolution in the, in the UK, and sorry, Britain, also started a whole new type of private money. And that was the invention of the steam press. And this guy, Matthew Bolton, took the steam press and designed it to press unbelievably accurate, accurately and fat and quickly. Basically, copper tokens that were almost impossible to counterfeit. So the first mass striking of modern coinage with detail in it. So very, very difficult to counterfeit. Absolutely. At the time. And but, and but you could produce tons of coins. It's, by tons, I mean sufficient. Six hundred per minute. Six hundred per minute. Okay. Basically, exactly. So this was new technology. I'll think about like the, I, I call this the first fintech, the first financial technology. And the state rejected it. What did the state care? They only care about the elites. They care about their gold, their, their gold standard, you know, gold coins, silver coins, the guineas. And property you know, title. They, 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 yeah, exactly. They didn't care about the average person, so they said they just they ignored it. They could have put all these people in jail, as well, right? So first of all, they rejected the technology. They didn't take it on board for their own mints, and they let. Paris Mining Company to start with, but hundreds of other companies take copper and make these standardized private tokens that circulated everywhere. By uh, 1812, so 30 years later, they were circulating at five to 10 times the rate of official currency. And this was basically official. So basically these, what they're called Condor tokens, basically became the official currency of Britain, of the Industrial Revolution. And if, so, they, hadn't, if they hadn't come along, there would have been a uh, like a seizure, a stoppage in the system, so to speak. Well, who knows, right? But absolutely. Yeah. Um, wow. The, 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 without that, you would have just, you would have had to get by, like I said, by giving the workers some of the tools or some of the take or... Uh, Side the, of beef. Who knows what would have happened. But, we, but here we have wage earners feeding the furnace of the Industrial Revolution, if you like, and getting copper tokens where they could take and use anywhere. They're accepted all over Britain and Ireland for that matter. You know, eventually the state learned its lesson and in 1810 it basically just took all the mints and privatized them and made the whole system better because now they're now, now the penny, penny we have today is this penny with nationalized mints. Well, I think your penny, <laughs> I think your penny story really nails a very important aspect of anything we talk about with currency, which is that both the user and receiver of, of a currency in whatever denomination and for whatever purpose we're discussing has to believe that the transaction will work. What worked in that case was why everybody suddenly started using those tokens and why the elite missed the chance to be dominant and, and to control the uh, local currency was that people between each other believed it was worth something and, and would uh, be good enough for a good or service. So as long as people believe the currency will work, it will, it will sustain itself. That's right. And that's difficult to do you know, across a nation or across multiple nations, though, although it has happened at times. We, it happened in this case, right, where it was, it was a nationally acceptable currency. By the way, there were, there were some bad things that happened, right? Some of the people issued these tokens that were redeemable for real money, and then when someone tried to redeem it, they didn't give them their money back. This is why it was nationalized in the end and why we ended up with, like I said, the official state penny instead. But I think this, yeah, the story really here, there's a bunch of different little stories here, but I think the first one is money scarcity is a problem, right? If we don't have money, we can't, you know, we can't do, a, we want the freedom to do a lot of things that we want. We are, we are, we are we're tied to our company. We're tied to the company store in the case of sharecroppers. We have to go to this, the right, the same brewery. We have to, we, we get thing, we get, we go back to a barter economy, we end up with, like I said, getting a side of beef or some tools or something like that. When we, when money is scarce, bad things happen. When it can just, it could Re be really bad things. Or, yeah, it could be deflation or the lack of industrial revolution or slavery. It's like crazy. Or the right? guillotine. And we know that money scarcity is really, really bad. Why? Because the desperate will do desperate things. This goes against everything we, that, a lot of people are talking about money, the idea of like the metalist argument about money, right? The money has to be like backed by gold and silver, right? Here it's the exact opposite. We need an elastic currency. We need something that will expand, right? The entrepreneurs who printed, who made up these, these tokens, they didn't do it because for fun, they did it because there was a demand. 
And the demand was there at harvest time in Japan or wherever else it happens to be. Or in the case of, an, of, of a rapidly expanding economy like the Industrial Revolution, it really shows that if we don't have that, it's, it's a scary thing. People will do, people will be, people will do desperate things. I wanted, I, I wanted to hear about the, uh, because I wasn't aware of it, even though I thought I'd been fairly well read in, in American history, I, I, I think it's uh, fascinating, but uh, post-bellum, post-U.S. Civil War tokens circulated in the South. What, were that, what was that about? This is actually one of the most interesting monetary stories there is, the whole story about the Civil War and the post-Civil War. And this is actually one case where mo- there was mild deflation because there wasn't enough money in the whole, circulated through the whole economy, the whole new unified United States. This is one case where the economy did actually grow during a, during mild deflation. Because the bank system was so screwed up, and, and it was screwed up many times, you know, we had First National Bank, Second National Bank under Hamilton, and then Alexander Hamilton, our first Secretary of the Treasury, and then we lost our, kind of like our National Bank, the, the National Banks, and they came back, you know, banks came back much later in, in very different ways, and not always good ways. but. What the problem that was happening here is you had all of these new farm workers, I guess, right? Who are working the land. And a bit like the Industrial Revolution, this is a new phenomenon, right? Before we had this like indentured, you know, servitude, a bit like, what you, like you had in medieval Europe, right? We had the serfs, right? And the lords. It's a very, very similar thing happened before the Civil World War there. There was no accounting. There was no need. No one signed any need to have small change circulating. So individual sharecroppers could buy the stuff they needed and then nobody to buy the stuff, not no small change to buy this, the stuff that they were producing. So, so, so effectively the entrepreneur solution was, you know, quite predatory, right? These company stores would come in and say, I will gi- I'll give you all the stuff you need. And then when you produce your good, your your crops, I will buy them from using company store tokens, which you then redeem for more of all the things you need to make your grow your crops for next year. It literally, and this this lasted for a long time in the South, even into the 20th century, to some degree. So you basically just re-enslaved the entire sharecropper, the entire sharecropping community industry. You could imagine that this is, it's actually, I never thought about this before, but this is actually a bit like what may, might have happened in, in the Industrial Revolution. You might have had the case where, as we just talked about before, you know how you, you kind of like, the brewer got a kind of a monopoly by by taking a small coin and exchanging it for brewer tokens. You could imagine that that went up at the higher level in, in the British Industrial Revolution, that we might not have had anything close to the Industrial Revolution we had. We might have had some sort of slavery or, or indentured servitude or whatever it happened to be. But it certainly wouldn't have worked out, wouldn't have worked out as well as it did, right? Because in, with we using the copper tokens in Britain gave the workers the absolute freedom to do with those tokens what they wished. That didn't happen in postbellum and post Civil War U.S. South. No, it was economic enslavement, the same thing that had already existed. It was just in a different kind of a different absolutely. form. It was yeah, it, it well it was. It, was just, it just turned it turned it into a, a cycle that you couldn't get out of. Uh, why don't we make the bad jump? things happen when you don't have when yeah. you, when, 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 not enough when money the working, in the system. when the working class don't have doesn't have enough money. There you go. So let's make the let's make the jump to a modern. Speaking of technology and the ability to print coins, how about modern technology and the ability to print digital assets? And let's talk about Bitcoin then. Uh, right. You right. well, sound like you've almost made a case for uh, digital currencies. Quite frankly. Right. So 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 there are pockets of private money regimes even now. You know, babysitter clubs are an example, right? <laughs> where, where you know, you exchange babysitting services among a small group of people. Um, to take a little bit larger econ- uh, economic case, in Switzerland, um, there's a, there are co-ops among small businesses where they exchange services in this way. And there are like you know, local, local town, uh, local towns or uh, business development groups will issue you know, like private currency, right? In Canada, we've got Canadian Tire Money, right? These are all private monies of some kind, but they all have their, their flaws. As I said before, they can only be used in certain ways in certain places. The case we had with the British Condor tokens was they could be used everywhere for pure economic freedom. So you might say, and some have seen some parallels between Britain in the 17th and the 18th century and 
the world today by the idea that the state currency has failed and therefore we, should, we need something to that's better than state. That's, that's certainly a pitch I've heard. I mean, that obviously makes sense if you can say the reason you should be involved with this is because the, the government's idea of the currency isn't working out well or isn't, isn't what we need. We need, we need to do different things with the currency or we need it for different applications and the government's uh, currency is able to perform, which is strange to me. I can't think of any, but that, that seems to be the pitch. And, and I, I think that's really well said. It's a really good way of putting it. The trouble here is that what is, what is the problem, right? The problem in, 18, in, the, in the 1700s, 1800s was that we didn't have enough money. We didn't have an elastic enough money. Enough, we, we didn't have enough currency to fill the gaps we needed, right? To make the economy go. So the private sector stepped in and provided more and flexibly more, right? When they, when they need more, they just printed, they just minted more, right? It's actually a bit crazy, right? It's an almost unlimited amount. I mean, one, one company uh, issued 300 tons of these copper tokens, which by the way, are like mostly big, right? Because the, they're about the size of, bigger even than a silver dollar, about four so times. So you needed a serious wallet, yes. Yeah, 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 they were not small by any means. And they're hefty. The idea was to have more currency. When, in Japan, when there was the harvest, we wanted more private money. Unfortunately, digital currency, digital currency is usually backed by extremely, extreme libertarians, I would say, who mostly believe in hard money. They have sort of a medalist attitude towards money. They think it's an advantage, the replacement of whatever money we have. It's, they think it's an advantage that it can't be inflated. Bitcoin has like whatever it's, it's the 2% or whatever it is. I can't remember what the number is, but basically, and then it goes, then it, uh, the issuance rates halves, like I think next year or something. So it's, it, if I, the inflation rate of Bitcoin or Ethereum is very low. Ethereum's case, it's, it's negative at times. And that's that's supposed to be a, a benefit. Okay, I don't, right? again, again, that, okay, if that's a benefit, okay, sure. It's that's, supposed to be a feature, right? Yeah. But what, what, the, what these, these examples show is that we need flexible money. <laughs> Right, oh. and that, and so private money that's not f flexible that, that purports to replace state money is, I would say, almost useless. Because just imagine if we had Bitcoin in Japan during the harvest season, you'd have deflation every harvest time, and the and prices would collapse, and the farmers would get killed every year, and eventually just stop doing it, and we'd have no food. So yes, you know, money's not perfect. And states have used current, uh, national currencies and control of money to do lots of things, not always good, not always in the interests of, of, of everybody, often in the interests of, of the elites. And, but that doesn't change the fact that when entrepreneurs chose to try and fix a system, they add it to it, they didn't subtract from it. So I think that is, to me, the most important thing. I think, so could a digital currency, could something come along that could add some value to our monetary system. It could be, but it, it certainly wouldn't be Bitcoin, mainly because Bitcoin has no flexibility. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that it's that we're talking about the right technologies. And by that, I mean, I don't think it's evolved to the point where we've got a legitimate intermediary between national currencies. In other words, a, a hybrid of what exists right now. So not, not Bitcoin, but some other, it'll be something else. A, a, so, bridge, so a bridge between US dollars, British pounds, euros, et cetera, et cetera, that is kind of a functional exchange that operates at almost no, you know, with no slippage so that you can, you can use the currency and, and move it around. The states can still be happy with the fact that they're basically controlling what's coming in and out of the economy. Uh, but on, a, on an international basis or even on a local basis, you can, you can use one or the other. Yeah, I can see that. So that brings, that's a really important point. I actually see digital currencies as a bit of a threat to efficient markets, and I'll tell you, efficient functioning of, of, of markets, I'll tell you why. This happens in Sweden. Basically, if you can't use cash anywhere in Sweden, or almost nowhere. But does everybody have digital money? No. So you go on the, you go on the, on the tram, on the streetcar, and you don't have digital money, what do you do? This is like, an entrepreneur should be able to come in, or hopefully the state will solve this problem, with, what are they gonna come up with? They're gonna come up with the equivalent of these Condor tokens, right? Something that the unbanked can use. The undigital, I guess. Don't be unbanked. I guess the idea of digital currency is that unbanked can use it, but the undigital does everybody could, does everyone have their iPhone, right? What if they 
hawk their iPhone because they need to eat, right? It's like, it's the potential of digital money is to actually leave people behind, just like the Industrial Revolution workers were left behind by the state, right? Who only cared about gold. Or the, the workers, the uh, farmers, sharecroppers in southern states were left behind. The digital currency has actually the potential to, to actually create more frictions among those who are not able to, or are not participating in the economy the same way as most people are. And again, they might do desperate things, who knows, right? right? Money it's, is scarce, but the desperate will do desperate things. It's not, so an, I think it's, it's not an inexpensive space in which to be involved in order, to, in order to develop any kind of hybrid or to dream about embedding this in an economy. So I would, I would hate to think to extrapolate, but if I, if I had to put money on the outcome, I would, I would say it, it might get less beneficial for the masses than more beneficial for the masses, at least in the near term, while the hybrids are developed in the digital space. Private money at times, entrepreneur, private monetary entrepreneurs have helped make markets more efficient at times. That doesn't necessarily follow that private money is a good replacement for a state fiat system. It's more about finding the failures and addressing the failures. But we, you know, we've developed the system for a very long time. The Fed was developed to stop you know, panics from happening in the banking sector, to stop panics from happening in the agricultural sector. And it does a really, really good job of that, as we saw in 2008. And, and actually, by the way, in 1921, a little bit of an aside, people forget, we had a, we had a, we had a great, we had a, not a great depression. We had a depression in 1921. What happened? The Federal Reserve banks extended credit. They created more money. Went from went from depression to the word roaring. As Absolutely, in roaring twenties, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So and and so we didn't do that in 1930, um, and the subject of many many. No, I just couldn't find books. the gas pedal those years. Yeah, and so and so so there we could have maybe used some more private money, but anyway, the the bottom line is that they, you know states make mistakes, but our system doesn't isn't awful. No, the U.S. dollar is kept. You know. If you include um, the interest you earned on deposits, it's really kept its value pretty well over the last hundred years. And people say it doesn't, but they don't take into account the interest. First of all, they just like they assume people carry their money on their mattress. I'm not sure that anything should be keeping its value if it's under your mattress, but that's a whole different story. I guess the, the idea is that we should take away from this, these these historical examples that we need at times we need to solve the problem of not enough money. It doesn't change the fact that too much money can also be a problem, right? I will. I believe personally, and I, I, I'm not the only one. Yeah, the Fed probably went a bit too far in the, in the Treasury in 2020, 2020, 2021, to um, expand a bit too much, and that's probably part part of the reason we have the inflation we do. We probably should have done a little bit of QT, a little bit quantitative tightening, a little bit earlier than that, in my opinion. So we don't always get it right. But the opposite problem is when, when you have too little money. That's when we get it horribly wrong, and in the bigger picture, that's the Great Depression. So private solutions can work, but the private solutions almost always involve having, putting more money and not less money in. So anything that kind of limits elasticity of money is probably not a very good private solution. Also, when I see private solutions showing up now, I will think that eventually there's going to be a government intervention in that area if the private solution answer is something that's legitimate, if there's a demand among people for alternative currency system. That is a very good point and i would say one of the most important points is that if it's a good solution it will be adopted if it's a bad solution for the elites it probably will be forbidden and uh and eliminated the status quo right the financial economic elites and the government often work together and have throughout history there's lots of examples of true innovations or very good innovations in the financial system that were stomped on and destroyed by the elites because they threatened it. And a great example, with, we had um, long before we heard any word of microfinance or microcredit, long before it was a thing, they had it in uh, 19th century Ireland and basically had microcredit. It's small banks that lent, to, lent small amounts of people to, to, for small things like running their business or whatever. For a while, that was fine. They were, let, they were left to run until they started to threaten the banks and the banks basically went to the state and said, shut them down and they did it. You're absolutely right that the state that you see a private solution the first thing i always think about personally as an investor in, in fintech is will someone else come in and take this away from you will you get away with it basically is the bottom line if it's a good idea and a lot of times the answer is no 
as we're finding out through all the different regulations that are coming through on money laundering and 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 uh, shutting down on ramps and off ramps for digital currencies, uh, that uh, the state still has a lot of power over the digital system. And I don't see that that's going to change much in the near future. At the Rotterdam is a conversation about topics related to people's interaction with money. We talk about financial markets history and many important connections to our financial systems, issues we think should be understood. If you like the show, please follow. Comments and questions are welcome via the links on the website. For information on Dr. Rashid Saludin and myself, Jeff Sandler, and for links to important references and Rashid show notes, please see our social media sites, including the website at therotterdam.com. Thank you for listening.